Welcome back to our study in the book of Genesis. We're looking at Genesis chapter 45 through to 47. We're looking at Joseph and Jacob. Genesis 45, 1 to 28. Gossip is one of those sins that is often overlooked, even though it is mentioned in a lot of part of Romans 1 as a sign of one who has turned away from God. What is gossip? It isn't merely speaking about other people. Specifically, gossip involves speaking bad about other people. It involves giving bad news. Did you ever stop to think what is the opposite of gossip? What comes to mind? Silence? Quiet? It doesn't quite get the point. It doesn't quite get the point that the idea of gossip contains a certain level of viciousness. The opposite of viciousness is grace and love. If gossip is the spreading of bad news, then the opposite of gossip is preaching the, good, the gospel, the spreading of good news. This is going to be a chapter of good news. Joseph is going to give good news to his brothers. The Pharaoh is going to give good news to Joseph and his family. The brothers are going to return to their father with the same good news. Throughout all of this, we ought to remember that we are to be also to be bearers of good news. We have the best news of all. We have news that means the difference between life and death. We have news that means the difference between hope and hopelessness. We have news that ought to be the cause of the greatest possible rejoicing. One thing that makes our good news so good is that it's set against the backdrop of bad news. When you go to a jewellery shop and ask to look at a diamond, what does a jeweller do in order to bring out the greatest luster of the diamond? He puts it against a black velvet background. Why does he do this? Because the beauty of the diamond shines all the more brightly against the dark background. The gospel is the same way. It shines its brightest when seen against the backdrop of the condemnation of sin and death. These brothers have been wrestling with a secret sin for a long time. They have hidden it from their father and have even hidden it from one another. But no more. As they stand before the Prime Minister of Egypt, Judah confesses his sin openly and offers himself as a sacrifice for his younger brother. He offers to take the place of Benjamin so that Benjamin can return home to their father. All of the events that transpired to bring Judah and his brothers to this point. They have been brought to the place of confession and repentance and a changed attitude. Now they are ready to receive the good news. Then Joseph couldn't control himself before all of those who stood by him. He cried, Have everything great from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers couldn't answer him. They were dismayed at his presence. Up to this point, there had always been a royal audience when Joseph met with his brothers. There had been Egyptian guards and servants and officials present. It was unthinkable that these foreigners would be permitted a private audience, but that is exactly what takes place now. All of the retainers and guards and officials are sent from the room. For the first time in many a year, Joseph and his brothers are alone. They don't know what to make of this. To the best of knowledge, Joseph doesn't even know how to speak Hebrew. Up to this time, he's been communicating to them only through a translator. It is a time of great emotion. Joseph weeping in the presence of his brothers is loud enough to be heard by those who have left the room. In the midst of his weeping, Joseph identifies himself. I am Joseph. It is the last message they ever expected to hear. As the implications of this statement begin to sink in, they must have wondered if it was the last message that they would ever hear. This is the brother whom they had betrayed. This is the brother they had sought to murder. This is the brother they had sold into slavery so many years ago. They had come into his presence expecting bad news and now that bad news had just gotten a lot worse. There's coming a day when Jesus will also reveal himself. He will return and he will announce himself in a way that he has never done before. Do you remember what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus? They were following Judas and he made the identifying kiss. 
but then they were confronted by a fugitive who was making no effort to escape. Jesus wasn't acting the part of a fugitive and this gave the arresting officers pause. Jesus therefore knowing all the things that were coming about upon him went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. Judas also who was betraying him was standing with them. When therefore he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. It must have been a comical scene. The cohort is there, the officers, the chief priests, the Pharisees. They have come to arrest this lonely rabbi. Instead of them questioning him, he takes initiative and questions them. Whom do you seek, Jesus the Nazarene? I am he. Suddenly it looks as though they are at a bowling alley, and these soldiers and officers and priests and Pharisees are falling all over. It's a strike. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to come back. The scriptures don't tell us what he's going to say, but they do describe him riding a white horse with a sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth. Perhaps he will say what he said here, I am. On that day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall be silenced except to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In this section the long speech of Joseph stands in contrast to the one made at the close of the previous chapter that was given by Judah. That was a plea for mercy, and to be permitted to take the place of Benjamin. Joseph also has a plea. It's a plea for restoration of fellowship, even as he commissions his brothers with a message that they are to take back home to their father. Joseph's message is one of complete and striking forgiveness. This stands in direct contrast to the modern thinking of today. We live in a day where the common motto is, don't get mad, get even. Joseph displays none of that. A call to draw near. Then Judah said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. They are cowering with fright, waiting for the judgment to fall upon them for the past deed. Instead of judgment, there is a call to come close. God makes the same call to us. When we fall into sin, when it seems that we have fallen from the grace of God, he calls us to come close. The scriptures tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is not a fear that drives away, it's a fear that draws us near. Genesis 45, 48 says, I am Joseph your brother whom you sold in Egypt, but now do not be, therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Notice there are no words of condemnation from Joseph. He doesn't tell him, you did, you did me wrong and I'm going to forgive you, but I will never let you forgive it, forget it. To, to the contrary, he urges them, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. The Lord says the same thing to us. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You are called to live in the land of guilt. Your guilt has been taken and nailed to the cross. Your guilt no longer belongs to you. You have no right to continue in that state. How can Joseph take such an attitude? How is he able to forgive so completely? It's because he has been given a heavenly perspective. God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph has come to recognize the hand of the Lord in the midst of his circumstances. He knows full well that the motive of his brother were for evil, but he also knows the Lord has a bigger plan underway. How can you forgive others when they wrong you? How can we do it by recognizing the truth? God can do something that can turn pain into a blessing. You may not be able to see where you are in God's plan or why bad things are happening in your life, that's where faith comes into the picture. We are called to believe in that which we cannot see. Forgiveness involves a positive attitude towards the offence, rather than a negative attitude towards the offender. Forgiveness views the offender as an instrument in God's hands. Jesus did this. He suffered at the hands of sinful men, knowing all the while it was ultimately God who had delivered him up. Paul, Pilate therefore said to him, You do not speak for me. 
Do you not know that I have authority to release you? I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greatest sin. It's not a statement that God was sinning, but rather is pointing that the death of Christ was ultimately at the hands of God. He was the one who gave the authority to Pilate and the high priest and religious leaders of Jerusalem, knowing that allowed Jesus to pray for those crucified. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Forgiveness looks at the wounds of the offence as a way of God, a way of drawing attention to the offender's needs. Forgiveness recognises that bitterness assumes a right that we do not have. Only God has the right to punish. Never take your own vengeance, beloved. Leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for so by do, so doing you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Forgiveness mirrors the way that God has treated us. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. A saving plan. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth, to keep you alive by great deliverance. Now therefore it is not you who sent me here, but God. God is in the business of delivering his people. God is not going into this business. He's still in the same business. Are you in trouble? There is a deliverer. The only reason God is a reliable deliverer is because he is sovereign. Under God's permissive will, he controls all things. He is in control of the earth, all of nature, where it appears to be chance happenings, nations, the heart of the king, evil deeds, the seemingly accidental and insignificant. We may not understand things as they happen in our lives, but God is looking at the big picture. A choice land. You shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me. You and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. The term Goshen is peculiar to the Pentateuch. When we come to Genesis 47, 11, we shall see that the land was also known as the land of Ramesses. The area is thought of being on the eastern edge of the Delta region. As such, it was well suited for the pastoral flocks of Jacob. It was really prime real estate. Many years later, the treasure cities of Ramesses would be built there. The land of Goshen was to the east of the Nile, and it may have had a significant, a special significance. The land to the west of the Nile was considered to be the land of the dead. All of the pyramids are located on the western side of the Nile. The Valley of the Kings, containing tombs of 18 and 19 dynasties, were on the west side of the Nile. On the other hand, the east side of the Nile was considered to be the land of the living, and this was the side in which the sun came up every morning. This was appropriate to the Jews because they served the living God. It's appropriate that they serve him in the land of the living. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. That would be an interesting conversation over here. These actions of reconciliation finally broke the ice between Joseph and his brothers. His actions in demonstrating his love in a physical manner communicated the reality of his forgiveness. Why is it so hard to forgive? It is because our hearts are not right. The good news of the gospel is that God is in the business of changing hearts. In the meantime, if you are trying to forgive, begin with an outward physical demonstration of that forgiveness. Don't wait until you feel like it to do a forgiving action. Instead, determine that you're going to forgive and then put that forgiveness into real tangible action. Joseph sent his brothers to bring their father to Egypt. Jacob and all his family traveled to Egypt. There were 70 people in Jacob's family who went to Egypt. Pharaoh gives them land in Goshen, the best of the land of Egypt. Now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Send your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your household and come to me and I will give you the best part of the land of Egypt 
and you shall eat the fat of the land. Now you are ordered, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Do not be concerned yourself with your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. If there was any doubt as to whether the offer of Joseph for a place in the land was valid, it's now dispelled by the Pharaoh. He gives his endorsement for the small clan of Israel to come and settle in the land. Indeed, the message is given, don't bother to pack your belongings here, because we'll give you better belongings here. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be invited to come and live in a luxurious mansion? Don't bother with bringing your shower curtain, your old throw rugs, there's much better that are available to you here. We have such an invitation. It was given to us by Jesus when he said, "In my father's house are many dwelling places. If we were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is our reaction to such a promise? All too often we focus on packing our stuff, forgetting that there is much better stuff awaiting for us. Once upon a time there was a man who was extremely wealthy. He asked God every night in his prayers of God allowing him to bring some of his wealth with him to heaven when he died. One night an angel appeared with a message from God. The angel told the man that God had heard his prayers and this one time would grant his request. And when he died, he was allowed to bring with him one suitcase, but one suitcase only. Finally, the day came. The man's life ended. He appeared before Peter at the gates of heaven. Peter saw he was carrying a suitcase and quickly told him that he couldn't bring that into heaven. The man quickly explained the story to Peter. Peter told the man to wait at the gates and he would have to go verify the story with God. and He would be right back. When Peter returned, he apologised to the man, explaining that God had never allowed this before. Just before the man walked in through the pearly gates, curiosity got the best of Peter, and he asked the man if he could see what he had brought to heaven. The man grinned with pride and said, Sure. The man turned the case on its side and unzipped it to reveal the contents. The suitcase was filled to its capacity with pure, solid gold bars, some of the most beautiful gold that man had ever seen. Peter stood there looking at the gold, and a notable look of confusion on his face. The man stood up, looked at Peter and asked him, what's the reason for the confusion? Peter glanced at the man and then back at the suitcase and said, why would you bring to bring pavement? Streets are paved with gold. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave the changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of garments. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread, and sustenance for the father on the journey. So he sent his brothers away. And as he departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the journey. As the brothers are prepared for the return journey to Canaan, Joseph again showers Benjamin with extra favour. The others are given grace, but Benjamin is given more grace. He is given grace heaped upon grace. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. John 1.16 said, Tell us of his fullness. We have all received grace upon grace. What Joseph would do to Benjamin in giving him special favour, so also God has done to us. We cannot help but note the parting instructions that Joseph gives to his brothers. Do not quarrel on the journey. It's a command for them to get along with one another. He knows them all too well and he knows that even in the face of true repentance, it's easy to slip back into old habits. Then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan, to the land of their father Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is a ruler over the land of Egypt. He is stunned. He did not believe them. When he told them all the words that Joseph had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, It's enough. 
My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. As the brothers arrive back in Canaan, they're faced with what may seem to have been a difficult task. They are going to tell their father that Joseph is still alive. In doing so, they're also going to make known their own guilt. This is what we do when we share the good news of the gospel. We aren't telling people how they can be nice like us. Rather, we're beggars telling other beggars where we have found bread. We are sinners who confess that we need a saviour. It's a reviving message. It had that effect on Jacob. The old man was strengthened and ready for the long journey. It meant the opportunity to once again see his beloved son. Well, he's seen many contrasting passages between Joseph and Jesus, and they continue to be seen in this passage. Joseph, he was thought to be dead, and news is brought to Jacob, he's still alive. Jacob didn't at first believe the good news, but Joseph was still alive. Jacob was convinced that Joseph was alive only when he saw the evidence of the wagons from Egypt. Jesus, he was dead and buried. The angels came to report that he had risen from the dead. Thomas didn't at first believe the message that Jesus had risen from the dead. Thomas was convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead only when he saw Jesus with his own eyes. Has the message of the resurrected Christ strengthened you? Have you said to yourself, it is enough, I'm going to see Jesus? So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, I here I am. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. And Jacob arose from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried their father, Jacob, and their little ones and their wives and the wagons to which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took the livestock and the property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons, his grandsons with him, his daughters, his granddaughters, all his descendants, he brought them to Egypt. When Jacob arrived in Egypt, he was 130 years old. He could have been on social benefits for over 65 years. Other older people especially are attached to their home and their furnishings because it gives them a sense of security. Jacob had to leave all that was familiar to him to go to a foreign land live among those with a different culture and language, with an attitude that was hostile to Hebrews. Jacob had hastily packed his belongings, gathered his family, and began the long trek to Egypt, just as Joseph had urged. When he got as far as Bathsheba, Jacob seemed to feel the full impact of what he was setting out to do. Bathsheba was a place rich in the history of his forefathers. Abraham had called upon the name of the Lord here, and had settled in this place after offering up Isaac to Mount Moriah. Here at Bathsheba, Isaac had been visited by God, and the covenant made with Abraham was reiterated. It would seem that Jacob lived at Bathsheba when he deceived his father and obtained his blessing, for it was from this place that he had fled from Esau and departed to Haran. Bathsheba was also at the southern extremity of the land of Canaan, later the land of promise would be spoken of as from Dan to Bathsheba. Dan being at the northern border, Bathsheba at the south. Once Jacob left Bathsheba travelling south, he would be living, leaving the land of promise, which was the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. How could Jacob be assured of God's blessing if he was leaving the land of promise? More than this, Jacob was leaving Canaan to go to Egypt. Many years before, there would have been a famine in Canaan and Abraham had gone to Egypt to survive. This had proved a very painful experience, one that seemed to be contrary to God's word. Later there was yet another famine and Isaac considered going to Egypt, but God forbade him with these words, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land. I will be with you and bless you for you. To you and to your descendants I will give all these lands. I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. How then could Jacob leave Canaan? to enter Egypt without stepping outside the will of God. It is this matter which must be have overwhelmed Jacob. 
he determined not to go one step further until his doubts were resolved. Consequently, at Bathsheba, that Jacob offered sacrifice to God of his fathers. The price exp expression offered sacrifice is only used once before in Genesis. When Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his kinsmen to the meal, and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. There, Jacob offered a sacrifice as part of a non-aggression pact between himself and Laban. It was an agreement made with God as a witness. If either failed to live up to his commitment, God would serve as his judge. The expression is used very frequently later on in the Pentateuch for sacrifices of various kinds. Only the context clearly indicates the precise nature of the sacrifice. In our passage, 46.1, it would seem most natural for Jacob to be seeking divine guidance concerning a journey into Egypt. God's response in 40, response in 46, 2 to 4 supports this conclusion. By means of a vision which must have come in his sleep, God assured Jacob that it was his will for him to depart from Canaan to dwell in Egypt. Three assurances were revealed to confirm God's approval of the move to Egypt. First, the God of Isaac, and of course, Babram, promised Jacob that he would go with him to Egypt and in that pagan land would make of him a great nation. Many years before, God had assured Jacob at Bethel that he would be with him as he journeyed north to Haran. Now he would be with him as he travelled south to Egypt. Surely it would be in Egypt, not Canaan, that his offspring would multiply into a great nation. Second, God would bring Jacob back to Canaan, the land of promise. Jacob probably felt he couldn't bodily and fastly return to Canaan so quickly, for he knew his death must be imminent. Furthermore, God told Jacob that Joseph would close his eyes, so it was unlikely that Joseph would be leaving Egypt for some time, if ever. It was necessary for the nation of Israel to return to the land of promise, for there all of God's promises would be fulfilled concerning the land. The land which I give to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Thirdly, God would give Jacob comfort in his time of death. After the report of Joseph's brothers, Jacob drew the conclusion that his favourite son had been killed by a wild beast, just as they had hoped. Jacob believed that the loss of Joseph would bring about his premature and painful death. Then all of his sons and daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, surely I go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Jacob would, in fact, live nearly 40 years longer. And instead of dying without his son to comfort him, Joseph would be there to close his eyes at the moment of his death. God would go with Jacob to Egypt and greatly multiply him there. He would comfort him in his moment of death through the presence of Joseph. He would bring Israel back to Canaan as a mighty nation. With this, Jacob could enthusiastically proceed to Egypt. The entire family now made their way to Egypt with Jacob, the patriarch. Several observations seem necessary to understand the purpose for including the genealogy of Jacob at this point in the book of Genesis. First, in later genealogical lists, slight differences appear, but this is only to be expected and does not in any way affect the reliability of the accounts. Second, by and large, women are not included in this list. This is not because they are unimportant, because it does not fill the purpose of the listing. Third, the expression the sons of Israel must be taken in the broader sense of the descendants of Israel, for more than his sons are named. Fourth, all those named in Numbers 26 as heads of tribes or families are found in this listing of descendants in Genesis. The explanation for all these observations is rather simple. Moses here intended not to name every person who went to Egypt, but every leader of family or clan who would come forth from Egypt. Many people are quick to jump on the number of those who might have came into Egypt as another example of a Bible mistake. Genesis 46, 27 says, In the sons of Joseph, which were born to him in Egypt, two souls, all the sons belonging to the house of Jacob, coming into Egypt, were seventy. But Acts 7, 14 says, Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, and seventy-five persons in all. This seems to contradict Deuteronomy 22, Exodus 1, 5, Genesis 40, 46, 27, 
which all say it was 70 persons whom Numbers 26 described as clan heads. From all this, this necessary follows that in the list before us, grandsons, great son, grandsons of Jacob are named who were born afterwards in Egypt, and who therefore, according to a view which we frequently meet with the Old Testament, though strange to our mod- modes of thought, came into Egypt in Lumbus Patrum. That the list is really intended to be so understood is undoubtedly evident from the comparisons of the sons of Israel, whose names it gives with a description given in Numbers 26 of the whole community of the sons of Israel, according to the fathers' houses or the tribes and families. Biblical commentary in the Old Testament uh, from Erdman's Publishing Company. The genealogy of Jacob, 70. The text speaks of those who come out of Jacob, while many more than these went down to Egypt from the nucleus of the Israelite people. The total of wives is a maximum of 14, Joseph's wife already being in Egypt. A compilation, a, a computable minimum of persons who went down to Egypt, thus is 1 Jacob plus 70 plus 14 wives equals 85. Yet remember that the women and children of Shechem were absorbed into the clan, 34, 29. Some of these, some of whom no doubt became wives. Remember also the servants or slaves of Isaac's house. Some, if not all, came to Jacob, swelling the number of those he already possessed. So there may have been 300 or more persons attached to Jacob's tent, Stigger says. In Acts 7.14, Stephen says 75 relatives came when Joseph sent for Jacob and his family. Summary. From Reuben, 5. From Simeon, 7. From Levi, 4. From Judah, 8. From Issachar, 5. From Zebulun, 4. Genesis 46.15, these were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob Panaram and his daughter Dinah. All three, all the souls of his sons and daughters were 33. Genesis 46.18, there were sons of Zilpah, from Laban gave to his daughter Leah. She bore these sons, uh, of these, bore these to Jacob, 16. Genesis 46, these were the sons of Rachel, which she bore to Jacob. All the souls were 14. Genesis 46, these were the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Rachel, and she bore these to Jacob. All the souls, 7. Genesis 46, 27, the souls of, sons of Jacob, Joseph, which were born to him in Egypt, two souls. All the souls belonging to the house of Jacob come into Egypt were 70. How many came down to Egypt? We are told here that Jacob's children, his grandchildren, and those who came from his loins were numbered 66. Jacob is excluded. Joseph and his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are excluded. But when added, make 70. But how do you get 70 in Genesis to 75? And so in uh, Acts 17, uh, Acts 7. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt. Notice Genesis 46 says, besides Jacob's sons and wives. This is the key. There are 12 sons and 12 wives. However, Joseph's wife was already in Egypt. Also in Genesis 38, Reuben's wife had died. Genesis 46 infers that Simeon's wife may have died as well. That would leave nine women to come into Egypt. So 66 of Jacob's descendants actually accompanied him from the land of Canaan to Egypt. And uh, add to the number the nine wives of Jacob's sons, and you have 75 people go up into Egypt. So we see that what at first a glance looks like an apparent contradiction can be harmonized when we really look at all the facts. Another suggestion, which is a bit more radical, is that there's a difference between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint text. They say that the Septuagint is quoting an earlier manuscript in the Masoretic text. <coughs> without, without appealing to the Septuagint at all, a solution worthy of consideration is one that the commentary author Kaufman notes in regards to Act 7, as originally given by George de Hoff. Jacob's children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, the made 66. Adding Jacob himself and Joseph with his two sons, we have 70. If to the 66 we add the nine wives of Jacob's sons, Judah and Simeon's wives were dead, Joseph could hardly be said to call himself a self, his own wife or his two sons into Egypt. Jacob was specifically separated by Stephen. We have 75 persons 
as an act. Kaufman continues, Jewish genealogies didn't regard women or even count them sometimes, and with such an attitude was noted during Jesus' public ministry, and for some time within the church itself. For example, the number partaking of the loaves and fishes was given as 5,000 men, besides women and children. When the number of disciples stayed as 5,000 men in Acts 4.4, 4, it was appropriate that in this inspired speech of Stephen, the woman should have been reckoned among the number going down into Egypt with Jacob, so Kaufman says. It doesn't make any difference to our faith. It comes down to our lack of knowledge of who was being counted by both parties in Genesis and in Acts. More years have been lived away from Joseph than with him. Now, after a separation of nearly 22 years, father and son meet once again in happy reunion. Now he sent Judah, Judah before him to Joseph to point out the way before him to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father in Israel, as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I've seen your face, that you are still alive. Judah had been sent ahead of his father to get directions to Goshen. Israel proceeded ahead, guided by Judah, until the party arrived in Goshen. Joseph travelled there by chariot and met his father. Years of fears, regrets, bitterness must have flowed from the soul of the patriarch as the tears flooded from his eyes. Jacob, satisfied in the sight of his own son, was now ready to die in peace, but God still had 17 years of blessing in store for him. Joseph was known to be a capable and efficient administrator. He is not ready to become careless when it comes to settling his family in Egypt. The utmost care is given to seeing that the family is located in the land of Goshen. The meticulous details of Joseph's instructions are followed exactly by his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers, my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. I shall come back when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? Then you shall say, Your servants will keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. And Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and brothers and flocks are herds are all that they have. And they have come out of the land of Canaan, behold, in the land of Goshen, he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to the brothers, What is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, Your shepherd's servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. Then said Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in, they said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, but there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Set your father and front brothers in the best of the land, then let them live in the land of Goshen. If you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Pharaoh had already promised Joseph's family the best of Egypt, but Joseph was careful to see to it that this became a reality. His family was sent to Goshen even before he greeted them, or they were presented before Pharaoh. Possession may have been nine points of the law in those days also. When Joseph reported the arrival of his family, he knew that Pharaoh would want an interview with them. They were told to stress the fact they were shepherds, and this was their sole occupation, as it had been for generations. This would assure they would be given the land of Goshen, not only because it would provide pasture for the flocks, but because it would keep the Hebrews removed from the Egyptians who despised shepherds. This conversation went as Joseph expected, and the result was the Pharaoh gave Joseph family the land of Goshen to dwell in. Furthermore, since Pharaoh owned herds also, some of Joseph's family could be employed in caring for his livestock. Why was getting Goshen such an important objective that so many verses were devoted to details of his acquisition, while such an emotional moment as a reunion of Jacob and Joseph was so sketchily described? First, Goshen must have been some of the best land in Egypt, that's what Pharaoh promised, and what he professed to give. Second, it was located near enough to Joseph that he could see his family frequently. You shall live in the land of Goshen, you shall be near me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. The most important reason for settling in the land of Goshen was not to keep his family isolated and insulated from the culture of Egypt. Joseph was strong enough to survive life in the city and in the palace, 
but already given in, given an Egyptian wife, the daughter of a priest, and an Egyptian name. What would become of the nation of Israel if they were brought into the city and integrated into Egyptian life? That is why Joseph ordered his brothers to say that their only occupation was that of a shepherd. Joseph saw the disdain for shepherds as a blessing and that would keep the two cultures from merging. To have lived and worked in the city with Egyptians would have been disastrous. Joseph clearly saw this and thus was careful to have his family settled in Goshen. As Joseph brought his father, Jacob, and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. <laughs> that sounds interesting, doesn't it? The word blessed doesn't fit this context. It's doubtful that Jacob would bless Pharaoh. No, however, it's such a, a sense of barak which makes it much more understandable. Since this is an audience, greetings, not blessings, are in order. This word is used in 28.1 for the appearance of anyone before another. May we well include the thought of peace, as is a custom in Middle Eastern territories, but not a blessing in the sense of benediction. 47.10 says the sense could be taking one's leave, that is to speak peace again at parting, Stigger says. The presence of Israel in Egypt was a blessing to this emerging nation, but it also greatly blessed the Egyptians. Indeed, Pharaoh was blessed by Israel. Joseph had virtually saved his kingdom. and the next section, he will obtain possession of almost all of Egypt's wealth, including the people themselves. In a stronger and much more common sense of blessing, uh, such as that in the next chapter, Abrahamic covenant contained the promise that Abraham and his offspring would be a blessing to all those who blessed them. I will bless you and bless you. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed ultimately. This is what we see taking place in chapter 47. The Pharaoh had greatly exalted Joseph and blessed him. Now he's expending that blessing to all of Joseph's family. The Pharaoh said to Jacob, Jacob, how many years have you lived? Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life nor have they attained the years that my father lived during the days of their sojourning. What Jacob said was true. This earthly beginnings were prophetic of his life. He struggled with his brother in the womb. He lived in a home where the parents were divided in their affection for the children. He gained the blessing of his father by deception and then was alienated from his family because of the hatred of Esau. He spent years in exile serving his deceitful uncle Laban. He sought one wife and ended up with four, and the outcome of this was continual competition and strife. He finally fled from his uncle and eventually had to make a, a non-aggressive aggressive pact with him, lest further conflict arise. He suffered the loss of the purity of his daughter Dinah at Shechem, and feared the reprisal of Canaanite kinsmen when his sons killed the men in the city and took the women, children and cattle as booty. His oldest son lay with one of his concubines. His favourite son was tragically lost and presumed dead. Finally, there was a famine which threatened the existence of his family, and the second in the command of Pharaoh appeared to be taking even his youngest son away. Jacob, you see, was correct in his evaluation of his life. There was a significant difference between the suffering which Jacob alluded to and that which Joseph had endured. Joseph's suffering was undeserved. Jacob's was not. Jacob's suffering virtually every painful experience because of his willfulness and foolish choices. Jacob deceived his brother, chose to live near Shechem rather than go up to Bethel, unwisely showed preference for Joseph. The suffering which Jacob experienced was due almost entirely to his sinful decisions and responses. Jacob didn't see the hand of God in his adversity, but Joseph did. Jacob became more fearful and protective, while Joseph was forgiving and eager to serve others, even at his own expense. In his adversity, Joseph grew closer to God, while Jacob seemed to drift further and further away. In this interview with Pharaoh, all of these better experiences may have begun to come into focus. He was wrong when he had concluded that all these things are against me, his fears did not confirm, confirm to the facts. We see this as a great turning point in Jacob's life. Just as his sons had come to the place where they acknowledged their sins had returned and from their wicked ways, so Jacob seems to do here. 
Jacob saw all of his sorrow as the result of his sin, but now he's beginning to see God in an entirely different light. The things that Jacob tried to withhold and protect, Rachel, Joseph, Benjamin, were the very things that were taken from him. It was only by giving up Benjamin that he gained him, and in giving up Benjamin he preserved not only Benjamin's life, but that of the entire nation. As Jacob stood before Pharaoh, he recognised that all of his striving had been for nothing. The land which he wrestled from the hand of Esau was left behind. So far as we can tell, he never enjoyed the fruits of his deceptive labours. The blessings which he did experience were not the result of his activity, such as peeling those poles, but of divine grace and the sovereignty of God. Now Jacob was old, and in the face of famine he was helpless and hopeless. In short, Jacob had to trust in God and not himself. This was the beginning of a whole new life. It was only 17 years, but it was a life lived in the blessings which only grace can give. Those 17 years were the happiest, most fulfilling years of Jacob's life. He didn't live in Canaan, but he had entered into Canaan's rest, a rest which is obtained only by faith and is forfeited by unbelief. The life of rest is not the life of ease or of freedom from pain and suffering. Joseph, like Jacob, suffered much hardship, but Joseph suffered innocently and in a godly way. God does not offer you a life of ease, but a life of learning to rely upon him, of looking to him to exalt you in the proper time, rather than your own getting ahead at the expense of others. Jacob's family grew in both possessions and number. Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years. Near his death, he asked Joseph to bury him with his ancestors in Hebron. He then proceeded to bless each of his sons. Joseph obtained some money of the Egyptians for food. Joseph furnished food to them in accordance with the number of their dependents. The famine became worse and worse, so that all the land of Egypt and Canaan were starving. Joseph collected all the money in Egypt and Canaan in exchange for grain, and he brought money to Pharaoh's treasure houses. Joseph obtained the livestock of the Egyptians for food. When the people were crying out for money, they came to Joseph crying again for food. Our money is gone, they said, but give us bread, for why should we die? Well then, Joseph replied, give me your livestock, we will trade you for food in exchange. So they brought their cattle to Joseph in exchange for food. Soon, all the horses, flocks, herds and donkeys of Egypt were in Pharaoh's possession. Joseph obtains the land of the Egyptians for Pharaoh, and the Egyptians become Pharaoh's slaves. The next year they come out again and said, Our money is gone. Our cattle are yours. There's nothing left but our bodies and land. Why should we die? Buy us and our land and we will be serfs to Pharaoh. We will trade ourselves for food. Then we will live and the land won't be abandoned. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. And all the Egyptians sold in their fields because the famine was so severe and the land became Pharaoh's. Thus, all of the people of Egypt became Pharaoh's servants. <clears throat> the priests are exempted and provided for. The only land he didn't buy was that belonging to the priests, for they were assigned food from Pharaoh and didn't need to sell. The people get grain for seed and food, and Pharaoh gets 20%. Then Judah said to the people, See, I have bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Here is grain. Go and sow the land. <clears throat> when you harvest it, a fifth of everything you get belongs to Pharaoh. Keep four parts for yourself to be used for next year's seed, and as food for yourselves and for your households and your little ones. You have saved our lives, they said. We will be gladly be servants of Pharaoh. So jo Joseph made it a law throughout the land of Egypt, and it's still a law that Pharaoh should have, his, uh, him, should have as his tax 20% of all the crops, except those produced in the land owned by the temples. Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favour in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. 
But when I lie down, my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. He said, I will do as you have said, swear to me. So he spoke to him. Then Israel bowed and worshipped at the head of the bed. If you've got anything out of this chapter, please feel free to come back and join us once again.